snakes around there. I'm not a friend of rattlesnakes for some reason. No, they're not my friend. We have a lot of them where I live. So we have experience with them. I let my wife kill those. <laughs> and she does. She's not afraid of, well, she's not afraid of anything that I ever heard of. But she's certainly not afraid of snakes. She was born and reared in China uh, in a town that she said she never went to sleep a single night that she didn't hear gunshots. And so she learned not to be afraid because she's never saw fear in her father and mother because the town would change hands every once in a while as bandits or warlords would come in and then finally the Japanese came and my father-in-law had a big hospital and he lived through all that and she was there 17 years. But I want to say that today as I walked out on that little place, I began to think and meditate a little bit and I watched a bird. I don't know the name of that bird. It's a big bird and it has different colors. It may be a magpie, I'm not sure, but it certainly has a strange sound to North Carolina ears. And then the bird sat on a fence post and he sat there by himself. No mate came around. Now we have a lot of doves where I live and as you know, they mate for life and they would go around together and they have friendship and fellowship and uh, produce little children, little birds. And, uh, but this bird today seemed to be all alone. And I thought about this passage of scripture that's found in the hundred and first of hundred and second Psalm. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch in him as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, tonight there are many lonely people here, many single people in the city of Denver. 51% of your population is single. And many of those people are lonely. And one of the supreme problems of modern society is loneliness. The modern city is a lonely place. Here in America, 70% more people are living alone in one-person dwellings than 10 years ago. A New York psychiatrist was quoted the other day as saying, New York City is the loneliest place in the world for millions. What would you say about Denver or the town you come from? An American university study reported that university students are the loneliest people in the United States followed by divorced people. Are you lonely? One of the principal causes of loneliness is alcoholism and drug use. Alcohol and drugs are efforts to escape loneliness. Drugs take you on a trip and being drunk makes you feel that you've got somebody with you. On the other hand, going with Christ is a trip in which you really always have Jesus with you as your Lord and companion. You cannot drink your way out of loneliness. Most young people turn to drugs for kicks and get hooked or peer pressure but thousands turn to drugs because of loneliness. A magazine cover story recently had a neglected youth. It said that actually most of them are properly clothed and fed, but something is missing in the lives of millions. It's a neglect of the spirit, the article said, which leaves them lonely and prone to drugs and alcohol, but all too often leads to suicide. What can be done about it? One of the key words in the Bible is communion, from which we get our word communication. Jesus came to a man one time that was lonely and sick and paralyzed. 38 years he'd sat in the same spot, lonely and tired without a friend. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you need a friend? And he said, yes. This bundle of loneliness and human pain had been buffeted by the surging tides of thousands of people. But Jesus singled him out. He became his friend that day and he healed him. He can become your friend tonight if you'll let him. Loneliness began actually in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect paradise, when man and woman declared their independence of God. They said, we don't need you, God. We can build this world without you. So they made a terrible choice. They chose to turn away from God. 
They went their own way, tried to build their world, and sin entered at that beautiful garden. And it was given to the next generation, the next generation, the next, the next, down to you and me. And we all have the disease, and it's a fatal disease. Nobody ever escapes the judgment of the disease of sin. So you, the roots of loneliness were planted in the human soul and we, has been inherited by every inhabitant ever. Because you see, in that garden, God went looking for Adam. He knew where he was, but he went looking for him. He wanted Adam to know where he was. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam tried to hide got some fig leaves and sewed them on. He didn't know he was naked till then. But he couldn't hide. Loneliness has never been a respect of persons. The world's greatest artists, writers and composers, kings and queens and carpenters and plumbers and everybody have felt this terrible thing called loneliness. In John 13, it tells about the Last Supper. And it tells about the betrayal of Judas. And the scripture says he went out and it was night. No one ever went away from Jesus but what it was night. Perhaps there was a time that you knew the fellowship of God's people and you had peace with God. But you've backslidden, you've gone away, you've turned away. You've fallen aside. There was a time when you knew Christ. You felt you knew him. There was a time when you felt you meant business with God, but now your heart has grown cold and hard towards spiritual things. You've been pulled away by others and other things and other gods and other pleasures that you know to be wrong. And you went out from the presence of God and you have found that it's night out there. You don't have fellowship with true believers and you don't feel really at home in the world you're living in. And certainly you no longer have fellowship with Christ. And there's no loneliness quite so bitter as the loneliness of a backslidden Christian who claims with his mouth that he knows Christ, but deep in his heart he knows he doesn't. How many of you are straddling the fence, trying to put one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom? Sin makes us lonely because it separates us from God. And it was never in God's intention for you to be lonely. Hundreds of surveys prove that our society has not made us a better adjusted or happier society. Oh yes, we can have fleeting moments of sensual satisfaction, creates a bitterness and a loss of sense of pleasure that no psychiatrist can cure. The Bible says that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and dirt. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman on the, at the well? She was a lonely woman. She had several husbands, had had several husbands, no satisfaction, no peace, no joy. Jesus came and talked to her, forgave her her sins, transformed her life, made her a new person. She went into the village of Sychar and told all the people that here was someone that knows all about you. Come and see him. And they all went out to see Jesus. The Bible says he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Even though great crowds surrounded him at times, he was alone. Even at the end, the scripture says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowds who shouted one day, Hosanna, that same week, five days later, they were crucifying him. And at last we hear from the cross, Jesus on the cross dying for you and for me. God laying on him all of our sins and our judgment and our hell, which he took on that cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, something mysterious happened. No theologian can explain it. Jesus took your sins, your judgment, your hell. All the penalty that I deserve for my sins, he took on that cross. And it was a lonely moment. 
a lonely period when he alone had to bear the cross and he became guilty of all the sins of the whole world. He experienced ultimate loneliness as he died for you and died for me. I've never understood how a person can turn away from Jesus when they actually see him on that cross. Dying for you and to reject him, to turn away when he offers you forgiveness, he offers you a new life, he offers you peace and joy and friendship, never to be lonely again. Through his death, Christ dealt with the primary cause of human loneliness, separation from God, because hell essentially is separation from God. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. Jesus suffered its agonies for you. Jesus was lonely for you. I remember when my grandmother died, I had the privilege of being there at that time. She sat up in bed with a smile and a glow on her face. Her husband had been wounded at Gettysburg, lost an eye, lost a leg at Gettysburg. And she sat up and she said, I see Ben, her husband, who had died some years earlier. And she said, oh, the music is so beautiful. And then she fell back on the pillow out in eternity. I remember when my mother was dying a relatively short time ago and all the wonderful sayings that she left behind on her deathbed because she just lived only for the Lord. She had a joy and a peace. You never went into her room that you didn't come out and feel that she was ministering to you. You didn't minister to her. And even when she was in a coma, she woke up one night and quoted scripture and the nurse said she never saw such a look on anybody's face and fell back into her coma and went into eternity. There's a great difference even in the last hour between those who know Christ and those who don't know him. Then there's the loneliness of your decision. Because you see, Christ died for you. He rose again. He's living. He wants to come into your heart. He offers you forgiveness and salvation and assurance and peace and joy. And he offers you a tough life. I'm not going to play games with you and tell you that it's easy to follow Christ. It's not. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross and follow me, you can't, follow, you can't be my disciple. Now, the cross was a place where they executed criminals. It would be like today, he said, take up the electric chair and follow me. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And he said, if you follow me, he said, you're going to have troubles and difficulties and problems and persecution and maybe death. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go all the way with me to the cross? Oh, yes, in the midst of it, there'll be his peace and his joy and his friendship and his forgiveness and his promise and the hope that he offers for the future. But there will also be the possibility of persecution and suffering and problems that you never dreamed of when you come to Christ. We've been in those parts of the world where people suffer because they come to Christ. You must make the decision about Christ yourself. Our reaction to loneliness is often to deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We get involved in pleasures, parties, good times, sex. We get involved in our work. We throw ourselves into the social world at the school. We read one of the best-selling books which urges us to take control of our lives. Any attempt to deal with sin without conversion is like struggling in quicksand. And how many young people today and older people are struggling in quicksand, trying to save yourself, but you can't. You've come to the end of your rope. Turn your life over to Christ. Let him bear your burdens. Help you solve your problems. Help direct and lead you. 
in your life. How many young people here tonight do not really know what you want to do with your life? Oh, help you in your marriage. Who you ought to marry. There's a lady talk to me tonight who said she's just waiting for the right man to come along. And there are many like that. Be sure it's God's man, a God's woman. I remember I took my three daughters aside when they were, oh, they couldn't have been more than eight, nine, or ten years of age. And I said, let's stop here in the mountain and pray for your husbands who you're going to marry, their boys somewhere, and let's just pray that God will lead them and lead you and that they will be men of God. Well, they looked at me as though their dad had gone crazy. But we prayed, and they got the right men too. One of them's here tonight. And we prayed the same way for our sons. Both, for the first time in many, several years at least, both of my sons are here tonight. I don't know where they are, but they're here somewhere. But you have to make this decision alone. If we search for an antidote to loneliness and drugs and alcohol and sex and encounter groups and psychological experiences, often it all only serves to mire us deeper in despair without a remedy. Through Jesus Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The psalmist that wrote that about the pelican and the owl said, Oh, my soul, why be so gloomy and discouraged? Trust in God. I shall again praise him for his wondrous help. He will make me smile again, for he is my God. Loneliness is often God's way of letting us know it is time to reach out. Reach out to the cross. And you'll never be lonely again. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter which said, quote, about a month ago, my wife and I separated. She moved out of our house saying that she could not stand to be around me anymore. We'd gotten to a point where we could not communicate with each other anymore. We were throwing accusations, some founded and some not, and bitter, spiteful words at each other. So she moved out and went to live with another man until she could get an apartment of her own. On June the 8th this year, I had come home from work, and after dinner I felt a compulsion to turn on the tube. I attribute it to the loneliness and frustration I was feeling. Sometimes the tube can be an excellent fire escape for a short while but it's not a good fire extinguisher, he said. Anyway, I turned the set on and randomly flipped the dial. The station I had chosen was just announcing the beginning of the Billy Graham crusade from South Carolina. I don't mind telling you, I was more than a little skeptical about televised religious programs, but I continued to watch. At the end of your sermon, which I felt was directed at me and my situation, when you call those people who wanted to change the direction of their lives to come forward and receive Christ as their Savior, I hesitated, but then I did. At this time, my wife and I are starting to put things back on track. Another one. Last night, I preached on John 3:16, and the people here said it all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And last night, more than 1,700 people came and made their commitment to Christ. A few weeks ago, no, no. A few weeks ago, in one of our crusades, a man looked at that same verse, and the counselor told him, you can put your name in that verse. You are the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, put your name there. Whosoever believeth or commit his life to him will never perish but have everlasting life. And then he had a grin on his face and he said, I like that. 
You can put your name tonight in that same way as all of those did last night. God so loved the world for you that he gave his son. And you put your name and say, Lord, I open my heart and my life to you. I commit myself to you. For some of you, it may be that you're going to recommit your life. For others, you're going to make a brand new start. You want to be sure how you stand before God tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we saw those people do last night. We've seen people in every continent of the world do. And more than three score countries, we've seen people do what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and say tonight, I want to serve Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to receive Christ. I want to come to the cross. I want to put my confidence and my trust in Him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that Christ lives in my heart. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because Jesus, every person Jesus called, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and taking a stand in public that makes it count. I'm going to ask you, if you come from that gallery up on top, it's going to take you two or three minutes, so start now. And I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium, please. This is the holy moment. And God is speaking to you wherever you are. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'll say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. Or you can bring your friend with you, but just get up and come quickly, hundreds of you. Back over here, over there, upstairs. You may be in the choir and God has spoken to you even though you're in the choir. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be a leader in your church, but God has spoken to you about your need of Christ. You get up and come. Over here on the ends, everywhere, quickly. Parts of the country that have been watching by television, you can make this same commitment tonight. And whether you're in, at home, or in a bar, or in a hotel room, you can have that knowledge that your sins are forgiven, that you're justified. And the word justified means just as though you had never sinned in your life. That's how God looks at you through the blood of Christ. He will come into your heart where you are. And if you'll make that commitment, pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on your screen. May God help you to make that commitment that so many hundreds here in Colorado I'm making on this beautiful Colorado evening. God bless you. And this reminder again, as Mr. Graham has just told you, we'd like to talk with you and pray with you, so make that telephone call now. The number is there on your screen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'll just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559 or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Pilate asked the question, what is truth? And truth, not facts, are what we're talking about tonight. And there's a difference. Facts are not necessarily the truth. 
They're the best we know at the time. But today's newspapers, I mean this day's newspapers, reported that public confidence in the leadership of our major institutions, such as the media, education, banking, government, the military, medicine, business, has sunk to the lowest in at least a decade. And every institution today is under attack in our country. The home, the church, the government. And many people are asking, what is the truth? They're asking, what is the truth about the airliner that was downed off the coast of Japan? And inside the pages of the Bible are stories of lust and hate and war and crime as bad as anything that we read in history. It's called the Holy Bible. It's holy because it tells the truth. It tells the truth about God, about man, about the devil. But Satan has caused a credibility gap to be established. Our magazines are filled with stories of Satan worship. Satan has his disciples, demons, sorcery, witchcraft, and wizards are front page news today. And the devil and his legions seem to be gathering steam for the last great conquest of this earth. Now, Jesus wasn't afraid to call him what he was. Jesus called him a liar and the father of lies. He said, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. In the Garden of Eden, God had said, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. If you eat of that particular tree, all the fruit in the garden is yours, except that one tree. God was testing man. The devil came along. He was in the garden. How did the devil get here? Read the 14th chapter of Isaiah, the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, and you'll get some hints and ideas as to how Satan came to this planet. He was probably the finest and the most gorgeous of all the created beings of God. And one day his heart was lifted with pride, and he decided he wanted to be greater than God. So he led a rebellion against God. Now, we don't know how that happened. That's a mystery beyond our comprehension. There's no use really spending any time on it because we just don't know. But, he, but we do know what he said to Eve. He said, yea, hath God said? He was putting doubt in her mind about the word of God just as the devil is still putting doubts concerning the inspiration of scriptures. Are the scriptures authoritative? Are they infallible? Yea, had God said. And then ye shall not die. That was the next thing she said, universalism. Everybody will be saved eventually. And then you will be as God. That's what the secularist and the humanist are saying. We're our own God. Now, the first time that man had to make a choice between God's truth and the devil's lie, he chose the devil's lie. And when Adam and Eve rejected God's truth and accepted the devil's lie, that was the moment that all the troubles of the whole world began. Our sinful nation, nature, often sides with the devil's lie instead of God's truth. Because, you see, we are now sinners. We're crippled, crippled for life. And we side with the lie. We'd rather believe the devil's lie than God's truth. And a child can lie before it can talk. It can steal before it can walk. Ask your child before he can talk or walk, did you take your sister's doll? And he, being unable to talk, shakes his head no. He lied before he could talk. And he stole before he could walk. Now, where did he learn to lie? The disease is inherited like other inherited diseases. You see, we inherit it from our parents and they inherited it, inherited it from their parents on back to Adam and Eve. It's a disease that is all through the whole human race. No group of people in the world are exempted from the disease of sin. And it's the disease of sin that is at the heart of the troubles of the world at this moment. Sin is taking sides with the lie. Now, the Bible speaking of the Antichrist says in 2 Thessalonians 2, this lawless man is produced by the spirit of evil and armed with all the force wonders and signs and falsehood can devise. 
to those involved in this dying world. He will come with evil's undiluted power to deceive, for they have refused the love of truth, which could have saved them. God sends upon them, therefore, the full force of evil's delusion, so that they put their faith in an utter fraud and meet the inevitable judgment of all who have refused to believe the truth and who have made evil their playfellow. And God also says in Romans 1, these men deliberately forfeited the truth of God and accepted a lie. God, therefore, handed them over to disgraceful passions. They see truth as a lie and a lie is the truth. And they make money, power, sex experience, and other things their gold and their gods. And they accept the lies of the devil. And many young people that are here tonight are accepting now the whispers of Satan in your ear. Come down this path. Take this drug, sleep with this girl, do this, do that, and you'll find pleasure and happiness. That's the way you ought to live. And then there's religious hypocrisy that brings no lasting peace. Millions of young people go to church without having a personal relationship with Christ. I remember I used to be taken to church by my parents, and I hated church. They made me go to church, and I had to sit there, and my cousins and I sometimes could slip away and crawl under the seats, or we could make little paper airplanes and fling them, and my father would always see it, and he would say, I'll see you when we get home, and he never forgot, never forgot, and I got a many a whipping because of what I did in church, and I couldn't wait to grow up and go away from home so I wouldn't have to go to church. But then when I was about 16 or 17, I received Christ as my Savior. And I went back to church, and the next Sunday I told my parents, I said, you know, Dr. Lindsay certainly is preaching a wonderful sermon. He's learned something from this evangelistic campaign in our city. And they said, no, he's preaching the same type of sermons, but you're just listening with different ears. And I was. And I began to make notes on the sermons I was hearing. Come to Christ. It's so easy to be in the church. Well, they even elected me the president of the young people's class, and they elected me the treasurer even. And uh, I was uh, looked upon as a good person. And they didn't know that I was rejecting Christ all the time and rejecting the teachings of the church and couldn't wait to get away. I was a hypocrite. Now there's another delusion that's going around among young people, and that is that peace is just around the corner. It is not. There will not be any peace in the world until the Prince of Peace is taken into account and the Prince of Peace comes. But we find deception, delusion, and the practicing of the lie on every hand. The credibility gap is seen everywhere. What is the answer? What can young people do? Turn to Christ. Turn to the truth. He said, my truth will set you free from the bondage and shackles of sin. And you that are watching by television, pick up the phone and call that number that's on the screen right now. Their counsel is standing by. They'll be happy to talk to you. And if you first you call and it's busy, call again. Call several times. They'll be there all evening to help you in your Christian life or to find Christ right now. There are many of you with problems in the home or problems with drugs or alcohol or whatever. Call and talk to that counselor now. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He is the truth. He said, I am the truth. I'm the embodiment of all truth. It's in me. You come to Jesus Christ, and he's the truth. He's not the lie. And he tells the truth. Jesus did not say, ye shall know a truth or any truth, but the truth. There are usually truths in every religion and every philosophy. But he's the embodiment of all truth. The scripture says about Jesus Christ that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That is the truth I'm asking you to receive and believe tonight instead of the devil's lies. Jesus said, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. If you don't believe that and don't accept that and know Christ, you're going to die in your sins and you'll be lost. Jesus Christ claimed to be ultimate truth. Are you willing to face the truth? Jesus Christ told the truth about everything. He told the truth about sin. He said, for within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and all the other sins that we commit. It's out of the heart. War comes from the human heart. Family tensions and problems come from the human heart. Rebellion comes from the human heart. We are that way by nature. He told the truth about love. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. You say, Billy, how, do you, how could God love me? You don't know what I've done. You don't know what a big hypocrite I've been. I don't have to know. I just know that whatever you've done, whatever you are now, God loves you. And he loves you with a love that you don't even know anything about because there is no human love comparable to divine love. God's love sent his son to the cross to die and shed his blood for you. And he would have died had you been the only person in the whole world. He loves you. Don't ever forget he loves, 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 loves you. And he sees you sitting there. And when he was on the cross because he was God, he had the capacity to look down these 20 centuries and see you and say, for you, Jim, I'm hanging on this cross. And there is being put on me right now your sins. You've told lies, Jim. Or Mary, or Susie, or whatever your name is. You've committed immorality. You've stolen. You've been a big hypocrite. You've listened to the devil. You've done all those things. Well, let me tell you, Jim, Mary, Susie, your sins right now are being put on me. I'm dying for you. I'm taking your judgment and your hell on me now. And I'm going to stay on this cross. I could come down and you could go to hell. But I love you too much. I'm going to stay here and die for you. And that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did. And God raised him from the dead, and he's alive. And so I do not preach to you a dead Christ hanging on a cross. I preach to you a risen Christ who's alive tonight and who is coming back. Yes, God so loved. And then he told the truth about judgment. Jesus warned people to flee the wrath of God. Yes, God is angry with the wicked every day. God has anger, and that anger is going to explode into the judgment. Jesus said, every idle word that men speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment. Every idle word, all your thoughts, all your words, everything you've ever done will be at the judgment, and you will be condemned by your own words. He said, except you repent, you shall perish. Now, that's truth. Unless you repent, unless you, Mary, Bill, Susie, unless you repent, you're going to perish. What is repentance? Have you repented? Are you sure of it? I was a good boy in church. I'd never repented. I might have said something to the elders when they uh, met with me to see if I was okay to join the church at 12. I didn't know what they were even talking about. I'd memorize the catechism. I couldn't understand it. It was just some memory things for me. I hadn't really repented because repentance means that I change. I change my mind about God, about myself, about my fellow man. I change my way of living. But you know, I don't have any strength to change. I can't really change. I can't really become a Christian. Why? Because I'm dead in trespasses and in sins, God has to help me change. He has to help me repent. And I say, oh, God, help me to repent. And then the second thing, not only do you have to repent, but by faith you must receive Christ into your heart as Savior and Lord. 
And Jesus told the truth about conversion. He said, he indicated, you cannot be born into the Christian faith. You have to be born from above, born again. And the process is called conversion, which includes faith. And Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he's not telling the ad he's not telling people to become like adults. He's telling us to become like little children and have childlike faith. Some people try to enter the kingdom of God head first. They want to understand it. But you can never understand it all. There are many things in the Bible I don't understand. You come by simple faith like a little child trusts its mother and its father. And you put your total confidence in Jesus Christ by faith. Have you done that? Repent, receive by faith, and then obey him, live the life, follow him, serve him, whatever the cost. And it's costly. Let's face it, in the world in which we live, if you hold on to Christian values and you live up to moral standards laid down by Christ, it's going to cost you. It'll cost you some friends. It'll cost you some money. It'll cost you a lot of things and certain pleasures of the world. It'll cost us. And sometimes I have a hard time deciding on some things. Whether I should have this or have that, whether I should go there or go here. Because we live in a confused world. Satan has confused us. And no longer do we even hear many sermons on being separated from the world. What does it mean to be separated from the world? The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world and the lust thereof shall pass away, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. I remember preaching sermons on that and hearing sermons on that years ago. Separated from the sins of the world, having our own lifestyle, having our own Christian culture, where is it? We somehow think we can hold hands with the world and make it to heaven. We somehow think we can have our one foot in the world and one foot in heaven and we're going to make it. We won't. So there's repentance, there's faith, and there's obedience. Following Christ, even to the death. He said, even to the death of the cross. Are you willing to do that? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Every day, newspapers, radio, and television tell us of demonstrations and marches and protests and bombings, all of which are designed to gain some sort of freedom. A little baby, for example, may scream and cry and wave its arms and legs trying to be free, but without restraint and care, it would soon be dead. I read about a baby, I think it was locked in a car, I don't know if it was here in Sacramento, it was here in California in all this heat. And the mother went into the store and she was only gone a few minutes and she came back and the little baby had suffocated. Baby needs care. A teenager rejects his parents in search of freedom and soon finds himself dependent on some drug or on some gang. Thousands of laws indicate that we do not have total freedom. Jesus said he would give you total freedom, spiritual and moral freedom, and ultimately freedom from the very presence of sin when we get to heaven. Pope John Paul gave a message last week in Austria on the prodigal son. And we have just made a, a motion picture, by the way, on the prodigal that's being released just about now throughout the country. And I hope you'll see it. It's the best picture we've ever made. And we've been making them for 30 years. But the history of mankind, he said, is the history of the misuse of freedom. The history of mankind is the misuse of freedom. Jesus will teach us how to use our freedoms for the glory of God and will bring fulfillment in our lives. Before you come to Christ, you're a slave of sin. No other truth can free you. Scientific truth can't free you. Mathematical truth or philosophical truth will not free you. Suicide will not free you. That only kills the body. It doesn't kill the spirit of the soul. Zacchaeus was freed by Christ from greed and Mary Magdalene from lust and Peter 
was freed from his cowardice. Christ's truth makes you free, free from the penalty of sin. You'll never have to go to hell. You'll never face the judgment. Freedom someday from the presence of sin. Freedom from the power of sin now. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you from right now on if you come to Christ. Right now, the devil snaps the whip. You obey. You're his slave. You don't think you are, but you are. You can be free right now by coming to Christ and letting him change you. I'm going to ask you tonight to do something we have already seen hundreds of people do in this crusade. And we've seen thousands on every continent. Oriental people, black people in Africa, Europeans, Latin American people in every country in Latin America except Bolivia, where we've held crusades. We've seen them do this same thing. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform as a symbol, a symbolic act, in which you're saying, I do repent the best I know how with God's help. I do receive him. I will follow him and obey him. Or maybe you're coming because you would like to be sure. We had a bishop come forward one night in a city not too long ago, and he said, I came forward because I wanted to make sure of my relationship with Christ. You may be a leader in the church, but you're not sure that your sin is forgiven, that you're going to heaven, or that you are free. The kind of freedom that Christ is talking about. He's the truth that can set you free. And after you've all come and stood here, we're going to have a prayer, and I'm going to say a word to you and then give you some literature, and you can go back to your friends. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. If you come from that top stand up there, it'll take you almost two minutes, so start now. Hundreds of you come from everywhere, from the back, from the front. And after you've come, we'll have our prayer, give you your literature, and you can go back and join your friends. But get up and come. If there's a doubt in your heart tonight that you're ready to meet God, you come. And make sure that your sins are forgiven, that you're going to heaven. Quickly, get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. As hundreds of people are responding here tonight, you can call the number on your screen where people are standing by ready to talk to you to help you with your spiritual needs and problems. Write the number down. If the line is busy, wait a few moments and call again. You that have been watching by television, there's a telephone number there that you can call and find help by talking to a counselor that's standing by waiting to talk to you about some of these things that I've talked about tonight, about your relationship to Christ. Make that call, and if it's busy, keep trying. I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Evangelistic Association, Evangelistic Association, Evangelistic Association, Evangelistic Association, Evangelistic Association.